It's July 1914. The war to end all wars is about to commence. And in the midst of all the fear and the build-up across Europe, 400 Seventh-day Adventists are meeting here in Battersea Town Hall to plan their future to elect their leaders. And in the midst of their planning, they put out a call, a prayer, that the winds of strife may be held back, fearful for what the future may hold, fearful especially for their young men. And they had reason to fear. This was not an easy option for many of them. They attracted uh, ridicule and uh, aggression from other people who thought they were opting out of their responsibilities. They were given their uniforms and put on board a ship. And then on board the ship, the issued rifles were being issued to everybody. And so when it came to them, here were 12 people who weren't going to take their rifles. They stood up for what they believed in, for what they were convicted of and they made sacrifices that approached those that some of the soldiers made. They didn't lose their lives, but they faced appalling conditions. Ever since the American Civil War, Adventists have taken a pacifist stance, and that was certainly true for Adventists in Britain during World War I, particularly the 130 conscientious objectors. I want to try and understand how they came to that position. Why did the church take that particular stance? Has the Adventist church always been a pacifist, non-combatant church? Almost from the beginning. Indeed, one of the reasons why the church formally organizes in 1863 and transforms from being a, uh, a number of separate Seventh-day Adventist congregations and groups into the formally organized General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is precisely because of the issue of non-combatancy. Uh, in May 1863, when the church organizes, this is the middle of the American Civil War, a war that had begun about political questions, but which by 1863 had clearly become about slavery. Uh, and one of the reasons they organize is because uh, also in 1863 the U.S. government has introduced for the first time in American history conscription. But they have provided for certain groups to, uh, to be exempt based on a conscientious objection to war, that is that their conscience does not allow them to bear arms. Now that was introduced because in American history the Quakers, the Mennonites, Moravians were important. Uh, but if you were an organized denomination, there was the possibility for registering with the government and then church members would not have to, uh, would not be conscripted. So Adventists in registering as a formal church could join together with these other peace churches. But it wasn't just a simple choice. It's something that they had to vigorously debate. Adventists actually start to say, should we be holding ourselves aloof? Is this not a just cause? Should we not be willing uh, to, to, to bear arms? You think of the, the battle hymn of the Republic, you know, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. This is, a, this is powerful rhetoric, and Adventists actually conduct a debate in the pages of the Review and Herald about should we be declaring ourselves to be a peace church in these very particular circumstances. But the issue that leads them eventually to saying we should be conscientious objectors is not simply killing. Uh, there are those indeed who basically say, well, we'd be happy uh, to bear arms and to kill in the cause of abolishing slavery, but um, if we're in the army, how are we going to be able to keep the Sabbath sacred? And in the end, what finally tips the balance is not simply saying, as Adventists, we cannot kill somebody. It is that as Adventists we cannot fight in an army and that includes that you will be doing violence to other people who have been created by God but also includes the egregious moral behavior and even more includes the Seventh-day Sabbath.
Now, I emphasize this because it does mean that the Adventist position on non-combatancy that seems so straightforward is actually ambiguous from the start. My grandfather, Oscar Dorland, my great uncle, Willie Till, were among those young people faced with the choice, conscientious objection or fight. Conscientious objection was a very unpopular decision. It was seen as the coward's decision. Well, I suppose you have to ask yourself the very basic question, and that is, would I be willing to pull the trigger on another human being? Would I be willing to stick a bayonet into... That was probably just as much a relevant question in those days. Would I be willing to stick a bayonet into another human being? Can I imagine myself doing that? Uh, would it be uh, the right thing to do? How, how could I live with myself uh, after the war or after the act, having done that to another human being. But in a war context, you do things differently. You do. You, you, you're loyal to your country, to your king. Yes. I think one of the things at, at play here is that sometimes in a war context and in other contexts sometimes, you do not, I think, have a choice simply between good and evil. Sometimes you've just got a choice between an evil and a greater evil. And the only moral thing to do at that point is to choose to do the lesser evil. Adventist leaders, indeed most Adventist youth, look at the choices and make that difficult but courageous decision not to fight. Uh, the social and cultural climate of 1914 and 15 was such that young men faced almost overwhelming pressures to enlist. Uh, Men who were dressed in civilian clothes on the streets of London would be approached by beautiful young women who would give them a white feather uh, as a sign of the fact that they were a coward. Even before conscription, Adventist young men have already been facing an extremely difficult choice in saying, no, I am not going to enlist. Of course, the pressure is doubled, if not more, in 1916 because now it's not only social pressure to enlist, it is the law of the land. This was not an easy option for many of them. They attracted uh, ridicule and uh, aggression from other people who thought they were opting out of their responsibilities. So I see it uh, by and large as a principled response rather than a fearful one, uh, and one which I uh, must respect. And of course, you immediately ask yourself the question, what would I have done in the same position? And I think there's no easy answer to that question if you address it honestly. And that's the question I'm trying to ask myself. I grew up pacifist, but I've never really had to face the choices. And as I stand here in this octagonal hall where Adventist leaders stood 100 years ago at the beginning of the war, and I look at the photo, it kind of makes those choices important. It's the choices they had to make. Those were difficult days for Adventists. There were only about two and a half thousand members in the whole of the British Isles, but unlike the Mennonites or the Quakers, they'd only been here for about a decade. Seventh-day Adventists, who are they? They're representatives of this American religion that's been implanted into Britain. The, the social and political elites have got no sympathy for what they see as this very odd sect uh, that doesn't represent traditional British values and which they would see to some extent as being partly a working class movement. Um, and for the political elites of Britain at the time, the working class should do as it's told. Uh, and so there's, whereas there's sympathy for Quakers, there is none for Seventh-day Adventists. And so they face an especially difficult time, and the, the treatment that they are given is actually, in some cases, absolutely appalling. Armstrong was a very prominent name at that time. H.W. Armstrong, Harry Armstrong, and Harry's son, Worsley Armstrong, who at that time was studying to be a minister at Stanborough Training College. You can see him here in the carpentry workshop, along with my grandfather, Oscar Dorland, who came over here to England from America in 1911 to, to study. As an American, Oscar Dorland didn't have to fight, but Worsley did, and along with 15 other young men from the Stambra area, he was conscripted and found himself on a troop ship to France. 
I didn't realise when I started this journey, but I found that my great uncle, Wilfred Till, was one of the 12 who refused to fight, who found himself in a prison camp in France. So I've come to Grantham to talk to his son, Garth, and discover the reasons behind his decision. As you know, when the war started, thousands of young people just rushed down to the recruiting office to fight for king and country to sign up. Uh, but after the first wave, the army discovered that uh, trench warfare was a lot more costly than they had expected. And so they had to start conscripting people. And Dad and the other 11 were amongst that first group of conscripts. And they must have been rushed to the front because they were just issued with their uniforms and put on board troop ship and ferried over to France. And it wasn't until they were on the sea that the army realised that they had some conchies on board because these 12 refused to accept their rifles that were being issued. They were landed in France. I don't even know which port they were landed in. But they were shoved off to one side with a, a guard. He got hold of Worsley Armstrong, who was the tallest and the biggest and obviously leader of the group, and made him start hauling a, a, a bunch of rocks from one end of the quay to the other. And when he'd finished taking them all there, made them bring them back again. However, despite that bad start, accommodations were made and for 18 months the Adventist group worked mainly as stevedores, unloading ships on the docks at Le Havre and elsewhere. But back to England and Dartmoor Prison, where 17 Adventists found themselves among around 1,000 non-combatants, including Hector Bull, who, before he died, had shared a frank account of his experience with David Trim. Hector Bull, for example, he was one of those who was in prison in Dartmoor. They were treated as soldiers. There was no option for them not to be conscripted. As far as the government and the army were concerned, they were soldiers who were refusing to obey orders, and that's the way they were treated. And so in Dartmoor, they were given very degrading punishments, asked to clean latrines without being given materials to do so. But as they would do so, Hector Bull described to me how the drill sergeants who were given charge of them would come and stand on their fingers and break, actually break their fingers in some cases. Um, they would be beaten, not sometimes simply worked over by some members of the, uh, the provost corps who were in charge of the military prison who would beat them up and then when they were down kick them leading to broken bones and sometimes serious injuries but also would be uh, held over a bedstead with one burly corporal at each arm holding them over and then beaten with the, the buckle end of a belt. Part of the pressure was trying to make it so horrible for them that they would say okay I will t you know bearing a rifle and going to the trenches is better than this but that, so there was a general pressure for that, but then a very specific pressure when they refused to obey orders on the seventh day Sabbath, they more or less knew that that was when they would be beaten. So for them, the Sabbath, instead of being a day of rest, became a day of beatings that at, verged, I think, on torture. By this time, everybody knew that being sent to the trenches was virtually a death sentence. The authorities had to make the camp worse than the trenches. And yet this experience in Dartmoor was mild compared to what was about to happen to the 14 young men in France. In November 1917, a new no-nonsense commander came on the scene. He had no time for the Sabbath observance niceties. You work on Sabbath or you're in trouble. No explanations would change his mind, and as sunset approached on that first Friday evening, the Adventists downed tools. This led to an immediate court-martial and a sentence of six months' hard labour. So tight was this regime that they weren't even allowed a Bible, the right of 
any British soldier, though they did manage to smuggle in a Gospel of John in their possessions, which they divided up between them and hid in their caps. They've stuck it in their forage caps, and can you imagine, with their hands behind their backs, they'd shake their forage cap down onto the little laps and read, and then if they heard that guards come in, quickly they'd duck their heads back into the forage caps again, and so they would go from day to day. And day to day turned into an endless round of beatings, mistreatment and punishment. If you want any indication about how bad that punishment was, the young men wrote anonymously in the 4th of April 1918 edition of the clandestine newspaper, The Tribunal. This was their Friday afternoon experience. In the most offensive and blasphemous language, we were told that this particular prison was the worst place in France, that they were able to break a man's heart here. On leaving the governor, we were set to work on the parade ground with some other prisoners working there. This was at three o'clock on Friday afternoon, one hour before our observance of the Sabbath day commenced. We had plainly all stated that we could not consistently work beyond four o'clock. By that time, five or six sergeants, each armed with a stick and revolver, had collected near the working party. As soon as we ceased work, with one accord, these men rushed at us and knocked us down in turn with their fists. As each man rose from the ground, this treatment was repeated. As they continued to refuse to work, the brutality of the punishment increased, both in the parade ground and then as they were dragged, manacled and thrown in tiny concrete floored cells in the middle of winter. Again in the tribunal, Armstrong shared what happened. The smallest pair of figure of eights was brought and screwed down upon my wrists. So small was the pair that to get them on, my flesh was ripped and cut in several places. The circulation was practically cut off, leaving my hands dead. I was then pushed into a cell and pinned against the wall by one sergeant, while the others, in a most passionate rage, struck me continually about the head and in the stomach. Then one burly NCO lifted me up bodily and with his knee threw me back against the other side. The contact with the wall caused the irons to cut more and sent acute pain through all my nerves. This kind of treatment continued until I dropped to the floor. I was picked up but collapsed again, whereupon I was kicked several times in the middle of the back. Finally, I became unconscious. Dad never ever wanted to talk about his experience. We only ever managed to get him to talk about it once. It was the weekend of Christmas 1938. War was in the air and uh, my aunt with whom we were staying who was a very determined sort of person anyway uh, eventually talked him into telling us about his experience in the war previous war because the excuse was that we have to know what to expect if the war comes along so reluctantly he agreed of course once he got started he got carried away a little bit and he spent a whole afternoon and evening talking about his experience. But uh, that discussion, that, that talk, so traumatised him that he had horrific nightmares for a month afterwards. Forty years later, Armstrong wrote a three-page letter to a young man inquiring about his wartime experience. When the Sabbath morning came, I remember hearing the door of the cell to my right being opened and the sergeant giving instructions to one of our young men to go to work. I heard other doors opened and bolted in the same way and finally the door to my cell was opened and I was commanded to go to work. I refused to do this in a courteous way, explaining once more the reason for my refusal. I fully expected to be thrashed and beaten, but to my surprise, the sergeant was quite affable. He told me not to be a fool, that all the other young men had come to their senses. This news, of course, surprised me, and I could hardly believe it. But I remember making the statement that whatever my brethren might do, I must remain firm to the truth of God and I endeavoured to get some sort of spiritual understanding into the mind of that gross sergeant. I learned later, however, 
that all our young men in the cells remained faithful. The sergeant's attitude then changed and the inevitable beating came. But that wasn't the end of the story. A short while afterwards, a little way down the corridor, I heard somebody whistling one of our well-known hymns. I was surprised to hear this because to whistle or sing was counted as gross insubordination. But to my surprise, I heard a voice singing with a whistling and it was only a question of seconds before many other voices were singing this hymn and I found myself spontaneously joining in the singing of that good old hymn. The singing of that hymn brought wonderful comfort and strength to us as we were there in that prison. It seems likely that it was a passing army chaplain who heard the screams in the military prison and went to investigate. That led to higher authorities being informed and, according to government sources, those involved being disciplined themselves. By the end of the First World War, there's a kind of, there's a lessening of the, of the pressure and especially as the, the balance of the war tips towards the Allies. But in theory, there's no lessening, but in practice, um, the treatment gets better. And it may be that that is partly actually because people were impressed by the, the courage of these young men. That courage paid off. Within a month, they were back in England, first of all at Knutsford Work Centre, and by July 1918, back in civilian life. Even so, both Alfred Bird and Wilsley Armstrong suffered health problems for the rest of their lives and died early as a result of their injuries. But the war is still on. 18-year-olds are still being conscripted and Glyn Meredith's father, Charles, refusing to even wear uniform, was sent to Dartmoor, where lessons had indeed been learnt. Dad was, that was a lovely man. Um, anybody that remembers him will remember. He was a very kind and gentle fellow. And uh, I don't ever remember him actually making any personal uh, negative remarks. He seemed to be quite happy about the situation. And he did talk quite a bit about his time in, in uh, uh, Prince Town. This, were, this was all he was allowed. Um, a little pair of very fine mesh uh, goggles. Just like that. And uh, that's all the protection he had. So it makes me wonder if his face got chipped about a bit, but at least his eyes were saved. Yeah. And uh, while he was on the moor, um, he, well, as he said, physically, he'd, he'd never been so fit in his life um, because it was hard going, but um, he was quite happy to do the heavy stuff. Uh, one, one of the stories he told us was very interesting because uh, one day he was having a go at a big piece of red granite which was really hard and he got quite good at it. He could find the fissures and he knew where to hit and break it up and he worked on this for an hour or so and uh, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't touch it at all. And there were two officers standing watching, took off their cloaks and they said, go to the shed and bring us a couple of 22s. That was the very, very big ones. And these two men took these two big hammers and smashed this piece of rock to bits for him. <laughs> uh, and this was a kind of experience, and I suppose it was, depending on your attitude, uh, to the situation. Standing in the tranquility of Stanborough Park here in Watford, what was the home of those 14 young men before they were conscripted? It's almost impossible to imagine what it was like for them in France, ending up in that military jail. I've got to admire my great uncle Willie and those other 13, that they had the courage to do what they did there in France. For the larger group who spent time in Dartmoor or Nutsford or Wakefield prisons, again standing for what they believed, despite the pressure from Lord Kitchener that your country needs you. Do you think those young men were right in taking the stand that they did? I don't think it's, that that's a judgment for us to make. I think uh, it's their conscience. And I think the church and the state, the government should respect decisions made 
on conscience. Um, speaking personally, yes, uh, I think they were right, but I don't think that's the major issue. They felt convicted by their conscience. They felt convicted by their beliefs as Christians. Uh, and they faced appalling treatment and immense pressures to change their mind. And I think uh, I, my respect for them is, is enormous. They had been brought up as very conscientious Seventh-day Adventists. And unfortunately, nowadays, people are not maybe as strict as they were in their day. They were certainly very 100% Adventists. So it, came, it wasn't a case of shall we or shan't we, it was a case of we can't. It may be difficult to know what choices I have to make in the future. But whether or not you agree with Wills Lee Armstrong or with my great uncle Willie Till, just thinking through the issues now may help us when we've got to make those choices in the future. Because conscription has been off the agenda for so long, it was abolished in Britain in the late 1960s. Um, and even in other European countries that kept it, uh, it was abolished at the end of the Cold War. So you literally do have a generation now who all of whom were born after the end of conscription in almost every European country, for whom this probably seems like a dead letter, which means if it were ever to be reintroduced, who knows how they would respond? And that's why it's valuable for us to tell these stories now, to look at these examples of people who, in the popular eye, would not have been heroes. But I think we can say now, with a hundred years perspective, were heroic because they stood up for conscience sake. They stood up for what they believed in, for what they were convicted of. And they made sacrifices that approached those that some of the soldiers made. They didn't lose their lives, but they faced appalling conditions, and we should honor them.